There are places like Finland who don't fund their schools based on property taxes. And so all school, they don't have this same kind of structure where some schools are so under-resourced and others are Taj Mahals. Well, why aren't we looking at other systems to try to do something different? Right? We're still stuck in that same rut. So I wanted you to think about that. In the US, <clears throat> one of the key forms of racism in pre-K-12 public schooling is how funding is organized. In most areas of the country, public schools are funded through local property taxes. So in richer neighborhoods, schools get more and better resources. But in neighborhoods that are economically depressed, schools get fewer and lesser quality resources. The funding system sets up a cycle where those who can afford to move into a wealthier neighborhood often move. They move because they know there's a better school on the other side of town. And those who can't are left to face the challenges of the schools in the high needs area. So again, something for us to think about as a form of structural slash institutional racism. I want to give you an example of what it looks like when a school is under-resourced. And I'm sure you can think of schools in Flint that are like <coughs> this. This is an example of a, a school in California. But I mean, I've been in schools like this I, when I taught in Boston. Students can't take books home for homework in any core subject because teachers only have enough books for use in class. Schools are infested with vermin and roaches and students routinely see mice in their classrooms. The school library is rarely open. In fact, it has no librarian and it hasn't recently been updated. The latest version of the encyclopedia in the library was published in approximately 1988. It's 2016. Classrooms don't have computers. The school no longer offers any art classes for budgetary reasons. So children have limited opportunities to learn space, volume, and linear logic concepts. Oh, two of the three bathrooms at the school are locked all day, every day. And students have accidents on themselves. The bathroom that is open often lacks toilet paper, soap, and paper towels. Toilets are frequently clogged and overflowing. And I'll just have you know, I teach freshmen who come from Detroit to Michigan State. And they tell me that they come from high schools where this happens with bathrooms. Like, Dr. Connors, no tissue in the bathroom. The, in the girls' restroom, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, paint peels off walls in many classrooms. School has no air conditioning for when it's hot in the spring and summer. 11 of the 35 teachers have not yet obtained full non-emergency teaching credentials. And 17 of the 35 teachers began teaching this year. So you have teacher turnover because people don't want to deal with these issues. They're not, they, they haven't been trained to actually work in these kind of conditions, so they leave. We have high teacher turnover in under-resourced schools. So this is an example, and you know, as I said, you probably can think of schools in Flint who are plagued with some of these issues. What do we do about that? And how, how does the, this is state-sanctioned violence. Right? I would argue that state-sanctioned violence, that it is the responsibility of those who we have elected in power to redress these issues in our schools. But they allow and perpetuate institutional racism by allowing this to go on. So that's one example. I want to also talk about the infrastructure around charter schools. Look, these charter schools, there's no research showing that they are actually improving things for black and brown youth. Now, the media will show you that one school that 100% of the kids went to college. Well, that's one out of, you know, X 
thousands of charter schools in this country. But it's not white kids populating these charter schools, white middle and upper class kids. It is black and brown kids living in working class, right on the edge of being in poverty conditions, and those living in poverty, right? And so educate, what used to be a system where you had neighborhood schools has now actually become a marketplace. So I want you to think about how education functioning as a marketplace, that's a whole capitalistic concept, perpetuates racial inequality and inequity. Oh, let's bring the marketplace concept to education. That's what we've done. But who does it disadvantage? Kids who historically and traditionally, their families, their communities have already been disadvantaged, right? Not those who come from families of privilege. So it's something for us to think about. How, how do we redress the marketplace concept? Can we? What's the pressure we put on our lawmakers? I mean, the Black Lives Matter movement has as one of its things to put a moratorium on charter schools. Stop it. Stop opening them. Um, there was a new report that came out on school suspension rates for charter schools dur during the 2011-2012 academic year. And the first time since the growth in charters that all the nation's charter schools were required to report school discipline data to the federal government. 95,000 public schools had to provide discipline statistics. Let me give you some of those um, um, statistics. 375 charter schools across the country suspended 25% or more of their entire student body during the 2011-2012 academic year. Nearly half of all black secondary charter school students attended one of 270 charter schools that was considered hyper-segregated. Hyper-segregated means there's, it's 80% black or more. Like that's hyper-segregation, right? That is not a racially diverse school. And the aggregate black suspension rate was 25%. More than 500 charter schools suspended black students at a rate that was at least 10 percentage points higher than that of white students. We're talking about within charters. So within charters, you have a school discipline gap by races. We know in regular public schools we have that gap around suspension. This is just looking at charters. And even more disconcerting, a little over a thousand charter schools suspended students with disabilities at a rate that was 10 or more percentage points higher than that of students without disabilities. See, I did, we, we could have a whole nother session where we look at the intersection of race, ability, and gender. I mean, our students, I'll get to this as a system, special education is another form of institutional racism. The way in which students are assigned to special education, right? The, the, the uh, program itself does not have to be bad but it has become a place for, I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't deal with your behavior, you must have an emotional disorder. I mean, we just, we just have kids in special ed who should not be there. They just shouldn't be there. But teachers either are not equipped or have implicit or explicit bias that they, that they just don't want to deal with, right? So I want you to think about charter schools and I want to help you deconstruct this idea that they're, they're the uh, answer to our prayers because there's no research showing, again, for black and brown youth and kids living in poverty that they are doing any much more to send those kids to college to even help them be successful at the K-12 level, right? But again, the media will kind of show us those highlights um, and it's not to say all charters are bad, 
but we need to have, I worked in a charter school for four years in Boston from the ground up. Um, and so I know, I've seen firsthand how um, kids of color and kids living in poverty are guinea pigs for whatever new, I did that innovation of that charter school. It takes a while. I was there for four years and they still really didn't have it together. It takes a while, right? But why is it that those kids are the guinea pigs and not other people's children? Good intentions don't always result in good outcomes. There are a lot of innovative ideas in education that actually exacerbate racial and social class and so let me talk about a couple more forms of institutional racism, and then I'll sit down and we'll chat together. Um, critical race theorists would say <clears throat> that no child left behind is a policy example of institutional racism, right? No child left behind uh, really focused on high stakes testing when George W. Bush signed it into law. Supporters really believe that it would improve the education system by building in accountability measures. If we just build in accountability measures, schools will magically become better because everybody will be like, I'm being held accountable. Yet that didn't work. And in fact, the, the accountability of mandatory testing made educators more anxious, right? I'm being evaluated based on these kids test scores, my school is being evaluated based on these kids test scores, and so if we got kids who are not performing, how do we weed them out right. so the test scores will look high? That kind of behavior. I mean, think about the cheating scandal in Atlanta, in Atlanta public schools, teachers working under these high stakes conditions and wanting those scores to be high because their job depended on that to lead you to unethical behavior, right? So how, how do our race neutral, class neutral, gender neutral policies on the face, but when implemented, lead to disruption in the system and actually the perpetuation of racism, classism, sexism. Do you see where I'm going? Policies that are meant for good, but when they're implemented, they disproportionately negatively affect people who are already in oppressed conditions. So No Child Left Behind was not a success. In fact, there's research that shows it led more black and brown youth to drop out, there's another term called push out, right? Drop out assumes kids made the decision right. to exit the system, but it's systemic structures that actually push them out in many cases. So you'll hear uh, many social justice educators and researchers say push out, right? Again, language is power. How you frame the issue uh, helps you think about how to redress it. And so No Child Left Behind led to more dropout and push out, which then we know if those kids aren't going to school, they may be deviant in the community. So now we're actually adding kids to the school to prison pipeline. See how these, these dots get connected. And now we've got all these black and brown youth in the school to prison pipeline. Stemming from you know, various aspects of the system. Right. Um, another example is tracking. How many of you are familiar with tracking in schools? So tracking is you know, when your kid is, um, so when children are sorted based on academic ability. Starts as early as kindergarten. Uh, your kid is in the lion's reading group or the um, bear's reading group. Don't be fooled by those <laughs> I mean, you know, that's not, but those, those groups are structured often based on your reading level. 
right? And teachers make assumptions that early about a kid's maximum ability. And so they tell the first grade teacher for next year, these teachers are done. And so now Jimmy stays in this kind of group here. And then they tell the second grade teacher, do you see what I'm doing? And it just becomes a journey. And so if you're reading above grade level in kindergarten, boy, they're gonna, you're going to stay on that high track. Right? Tracking ability grouping does not have to be discriminatory if kids are able to move in and out of groups. But too often, they're not. They get locked in. And most often, the research shows this, kids of color and kids living in poverty are in the lower level classes because teachers have lower expectations for their ability, you know? I mean, you teachers have to check their bias at the door. A kid comes in, their hair isn't combed, you know, they might smell bad. A teacher is making an unconscious or conscious assumption about that kid already. Many times they don't know that. And it affects the way they interact with them in the classroom, if they call on them or not. Um, what, uh, what they refer them for or not, so access to opportunities. Do you see where I'm going? Versus a kid who's well-dressed and speaks well. Um, I use the example often of, you all don't know, but I'm trying really hard to talk fast. Um, I just have a slow southern drive. It's gotten better over the years. But as a little girl, it was so slow, <laughs> so slow. And I will never forget my first grade teacher called my mom and said, you know, I think Dorinda should be tested for special education. And my mother was like, well, what are you basing that on? Have you, you know, have you seen some performance or something? She said, oh, I just, I think she should be tested for special education. And my, you know, my parents were aware that I had this, bit, nobody talked as slow as me. In fact, it was my mother's uncle, Uncle Jack, who, it was just genetics. We were the only two in the family who talked this slow. And so my mother told, called that school, I remember, she told the principal, I remember all of this. She said, you can test my daughter, but you're going to test her for gifted ed because the teacher has no basis for testing her for special education. I was a quiet, reserved child, and I talked really slow. She had made some assumptions about me. They tested me as a first grader. I tested on a fourth grade level. You know, and so I think about if my mother, I, I ended up skipping from first to third. My parents didn't want to skip me two grades. But I think about if I didn't have an advocate. See, many kids don't have an advocate. My mom knew the system. She was the college instructor. I want you to think about, you know, for whom do you need to be an advocate? Because some of these kids' parents either are afraid to challenge the system because they didn't have a good experience with the system, so they're even afraid to speak up for their child. Or some of these kids, you know, the messages they hear at home are, well, you must be slow. You must be dumb. Stop acting up, right? Many kids living and learning in conditions that are less than ideal aren't hearing messages that would lift them up. And so with where, where, who's the advocate, right? So I tr the, in East Lansing, I try to be an advocate. I mean, I, my kids will be fine. I know how to work the system. I know how to navigate it. But there are plenty of kids of color in East Lansing Public Schools that parents don't know. So I, th that's my job, to, to look out for those kids and make sure they get the same opportunities. So you have to find your place in dismantling structural and institutional and cultural racism, right? Um, so I, I use that to talk about I could have easily ended up in special education, perhaps, Right, if my parents kind of say, okay. And then in some cultures, they believe the school knows best. In some cultures, right? 
I'm sending my kid to school. School knows best. I'm going to stay out of that. And so we have to help families from those cultures understand, mm, the school may not always be doing what's best for your child. And that that actually perpetuates racism. So special education, we know by research that more black and brown youth are in special education. We're overrepresented. Over means relative to the percentage of black and brown kids in public schools, the percentage of special ed is too high. That's what overrepresentation means. We're underrepresented in AP courses and college prep courses. So again, relative to the percentage number for your group in the public school system is too few of us in those classes. And what a lot of families don't understand is oftentimes the way to AP and college prep courses is through teacher recommendation. So if teachers have implicit biases, they're less likely to recommend the kid living in poverty, the black male with his pants hanging down in the dreads, right? I mean, do you see what I'm saying? If teacher recommendation is that primary avenue, there are a lot of kids who aren't getting recommended just based on teacher bias. And that's a function of institutional racism. And then there are a lot of kids getting recommended, as I said earlier, to special ed who don't need to be there. So I'll wrap up with using a couple more examples around um, curriculum. Uh, critical race theorists would say that the official school curriculum is Eurocentric. I mean, y'all been to school. What did you learn? And when you learned about people of color, what, how was, what was the message? What did the textbook say? So the curriculum itself maintains a white supremacist master script, right? And that we need, that the narrative on um, any part of history, I'm sorry, any part of history is a white narrative. You know, I, I, I was one of those kids who, I, you didn't do well in school, I just did well in school. But I think about, I love history now. Because after I went to college, I was able to take my African American history courses, and it was told from a different perspective. I was like, that's not how I learned it in school. Or I only got one story. There's a danger, as uh, Chimamanda Adichie says, in a single story. That there are multiple narratives about one scenario. Whose narrative do we get? And so critical race theorists say um, that you know, there's, a, there's a revisionist history element to history. It's, it has been rewritten in one perspective. And so for schools, we have to be vigilant to say, OK, that's the topic for the week. How, how are they learning about that topic? You know, my kids are in second and fourth grade. And I'm always, what, what children's books are on these shelves? They need, there needs to be a variety. And I'm always helping them, those teachers, uh, have a plethora of children's books so that all the kids, um, it's not just for my children. White kids need to see variations of black and brown people because they are born into categories of privilege, they probably need the variations more than the kids of color. Do you see what I'm saying? Because they are more likely to perpetuate the white supremacist system. They're advantaged by it. So we have to think about how the official school curriculum has a white supremacist master script, meaning the stories of black and brown people and communities are either muted or erased. I just wanted to bring out some examples. You've probably seen these things. I mean, this is real, and I just keep using uh, slavery because it's the most common one. Every February, just watch the news, uh, stay on uh, the internet, 
you'll see some silly teacher has come up with some foolish assignment, thinking they're being culturally relevant. Here's a math problem. Each tree had 56 oranges. If eight slaves picked them equally, then how much would each slave pick? This was a word problem in a third grade classroom in Gwinnett County, Georgia a few years ago. That teacher got fired. This made national news. And that teacher probably thought she was being culturally relevant by integrating slaves into the word problem. See, that's pro that's problem, that's racist. <laughs> I mean, at the very classroom level. Um, I had another one I want to share. Oh, here's another one. It's often done in math. In a slave ship, there can be 3,799 slaves. One day, the slaves took over the ship. 1,897 are dead. How many slaves are alive? That's a math word problem in a fourth grade classroom in Manhattan, of all places, right? Teachers, uninformed, I mean, just ignorant. How does this happen? This same teacher, one slave got whipped five times a day. How many times did he get whipped in a month if there are 31 days? Another slave got whipped nine times a day. How many times did he get whipped in a month? How many times did the two slaves get whipped together in one month? I mean, it's just, it's almost unbelievable, right? <laughs> and so what is the purpose, you ask yourselves? And so parents have to bring these things up. That was in Manhattan, a fourth grade class. Even in East Lansing, I'm embarrassed to say it, but a couple years ago, a teacher gave an assignment, I think this was at the middle school, asking students to write like a, I think, three paragraph essay about the benefits of slaves uh, quilting and making baskets during slavery. So let's put a positive spin on their oppression. What was the benefit of quilt making and weaving baskets? That's problematic, right? But that's a lens by which to express, well, here's some good that came out of their oppression. They made quilts and weaved baskets. That's a dangerous way of telling the narrative. You see what I'm saying? But that teacher probably <coughs> thought she was being culturally relevant. Um, so these are the kinds of instructional practices that perpetuate racism. And we have to be in tune to this. I often tell parents and, and uh, community members the best thing to do is go to the school board meetings. Go to the school board meetings for your district. Uh, go to parent-teacher council if you can. And if they have those parent-teacher council meetings at times where people are working, you call that superintendent's office and say, y'all need to have these meetings at some different time. Everybody's not a stay-at-home soccer mom. Why are the meetings at 10 o'clock in the morning when folks are at work? You need to have some of the meetings in the evening so that other types of parents can attend. Those are the kinds of structures that perpetuate inequity. I can't even get in the dialogue if the parent council meetings are always when people are at work. You see what I'm saying? We have to be attuned to these things. 